the People to Credit again at the Asia Society, 1990, and now our wonderful speaker, Jonas Edmund. Now, Jonas is going to be talking about a variety of Chinese American experiences that you can bring into your classroom. Jonas is uniquely qualified to do this. Uh, he, as I said, works for SPICE, the Stanford Program on International and Cross-Cultural Education. Go to their website, take advantage of those resources, and join their professional develop work, development workshops at various times. Jonas is a curriculum de developer and he's an educator. I envy his range of experiences. This is somebody who's gone to high school in Japan, graduated from college in Sweden and in the United States, and has taught, with, uh, taught students and worked with teachers on three continents. I got to know Jonas a little bit some years ago when we went together to a conference for international schools and provided a variety of programs on China. Jonas is going to be talking about Chinese American experiences. And this is built into the curriculum for many districts, but he'll also offer some ideas on how you can sneak it in where it may not be mandated. Of course, we know about uh, the involvement of Chinese immigrants in the building of the cross-continental railroad. Uh, we know something of those experiences. They bring this to life. Stanford has a major research program that Jonas will be introducing. But also, we have, uh, you know, here on the West Coast, Angel Island is as important as Ellis Island, but much less well-known. And we're hoping that you can bring some of those stories into your classrooms. So ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from Jonas Edmund. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Clay, for uh, that very, very kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, Rexel and Margaret, uh, for putting this together. It is, um, I'm delighted to be here as a representative for SPICE to share some of the curriculum that we've created uh, over the years on uh, Chinese American experiences and uh, uh, China in general. So let me just start by sharing my presentation. Let's see. Mm, oh, that's not the right one. Oh, yep, yeah, there we go. And go to. There and swap displays. Okay, so hopefully uh, you will all be able to see this. Um, I'd like to start by giving just a brief, uh, brief overview of Spice. So Spice is a. Oh, sorry. Just noticed that this popped up again. Bear with me for a second. Uh, okay. So hopefully, hopefully you can see that. Um, SPICE is a program of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University, where we serve as a bridge between research at FSI uh, and Stanford in general, and K through 12 and community colleges. Uh, we do this really in three different ways. Number one is we develop curriculum materials uh, on international topics. Uh, so I'll be sharing some of those curriculum materials with you today. Um, we also offer professional development workshops and seminars, which is, for example, why I'm here today. And we offer online courses for high school students. Um, of particular interest might be, for those of you here today, might be in the program that we offer for high school students interested in learning about China. Um, and there's more information about that on the SPICE website, which I can share a little bit later. Um, I should also mention that SPICE was, uh, has its genesis uh, in uh, it, something that was related to China. It was uh, started in 1973, the year after Nixon went to China. And the major reason for the program to start at that point was to offer schools uh, a wider and a more multidimensional context for teaching about China. Because in 1972, 1973, 
the materials that existed about China uh, were quite one dimensional and very limited. Uh, and ever since then, SPICE has in different iterations and in different forms continued that project, which is really teaching, providing curriculum for teachers to be able to teach international topics uh, in that's multi contextual and not uh, narrow and from one point of view. So it's really great to be here today talking about China and Chinese American experiences, uh, seeing as that's how SPICE started. So um, just a bit of an overview of what we have to offer at SPICE. We have dozens of curriculum, uh, curricula and lesson plans on China. Um, here are some of the ones that I've highlighted here. Um, it's everything from ethnic minorities in in China uh, to China's cultural revolution, religions and philosophies in China. Um, Along the Silk Road is one of our most uh, most popular units, which obviously deals with the Silk Road. And uh, Divided Memories is another unit that we have that looks at textbooks, uh, textbook histories and compares how different countries write about the same events. So for example, writing about World War II, what does that look like in a Chinese uh, maybe a Chinese uh, uh, textbook or as compared to a Japanese textbook as compared to a US textbook. Uh, so these materials are all available on the SPICE website. Um, some of them are available. We do have uh, materials available for free. Uh, we're expanding that, that option, uh, online materials and others you, you have to download. Um, all the cur curriculum material I'll be sharing with you today, you will be getting access to uh, in, in one form or another. So I'll let you know about that as well. Okay, uh, so teaching about Chinese American experiences. Uh, that's what my presentation today is about. And really, I, I wanna give you an overview of the three different, three different uh, lesson plans or curriculum materials that I'm gonna give an overview of in this presentation. Um, I know you have lots of other people who are content experts on China. That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm not a content expert uh, and that's not uh, what I hope to provide for you today. Rather, what I hope to provide is some material resources that will help you uh, in teaching about China. Um, I know in my experience teaching high school and middle school uh, you know, having the right material makes such a big difference and we're hoping that you'll be able to incorporate some of this material. So, um, a quick overview here. Um, first, I'll share some of uh, the materials that we have online and the work that we've done with the Chinese Railroad, Railroad Workers Project, uh, in Railroad Workers in North America Project, um, which is a really a huge research project at Stanford University um, looking at the lives of Chinese in America during uh, the building of the of the railroad. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Then I'll be sharing a graphic novel that we produced about Angel Island, um, which I think it can be an excellent resource for students uh, as an introduction to Angel Island, um, middle school or high school level. And finally, uh, we'll be sharing uh, our teacher's guide that we created for this book, Chinese American Voices, which collects primary sources of Chinese Americans all across the US. Um, and I'll be sharing some of the uh, activities that we've created for that book. Okay, uh, so when we started, when I, about 10 years ago, uh, when we created the Angel Island graphic novel, um, we were looking through, I was looking through textbooks, uh, and this is a typical textbook, U.S. history textbook uh, that I found, and here is what uh, information was in there about uh, Chinese Americans or even just Asian Americans. It's uh, quite paltry, just two paragraphs, um, and there's really not a lot of information there. Uh, you know, Students learn much more about Ellis Island than, for example, they do about Angel Island. And there's really been a huge gap, as I'm sure all of you are aware, a huge gap in, uh, in awareness. Um, 
when it comes to uh, the Chinese American experiences and Asian American experiences in general. So let's see. Okay, um, the Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project. So this is a project that has spanned about 10 years at Stanford University, and its primary goal is to give voice to the Chinese migrants who labored on the transcontinental railroad. Um, it brings together historians and scholars, not just at Stanford, but also in Asia as well. Uh, so it's looking from its providing perspectives and research that's done here in the United States, as well in, in China and areas where, uh, where Chinese immigrants came from, um, and combining those two to create, give a fuller picture of the lives of Chinese, Chinese who worked on the railroad. Uh, it brings together not just historians, but archeologists and other scholars in a range of disciplines. So it's truly multidisciplinary. And I will share a bit of the website in just a second. Um, but first I wanna show you some of the key questions that this tries to answer, this, uh, this project tries to answer. Um, and you'll see here uh, what it looks like. Now what, what I can actually, I, I noticed that I can see the Q&A here. So I was thinking, if you if you look at these questions, what's what's something that strikes you? What um, what's your reaction when you see these questions? And this is a major. If you think about this, is a major research project that is being done that right now at Stanford. And if you want to type in your question uh, or response, we can use the Q and A for your responses. Uh, to respond to Jonas's inquiry. What do you think when you see these questions? Yeah, what surprises you? Or is there something that surprises you about it? Or is there a question in particular that you find, uh, that you find more interesting than the others? Let me give it a minute, see if anyone has any, any thoughts on this. Uh, Pete mentions the impact the Chinese had on the building of America. Okay, yeah, and I see, I see uh, Chen Man says, what surprised me is how little I know the answers. Yep. And I think that Chen Man, how little you know the answers and how little anyone knows the answers. Um, I think what, what surprised me about these key questions is these are questions not that it, you know, they don't come across as uh, sort of academic research uh, questions. They come across as questions that, uh, you know, middle school, elementary school kids might ask. Uh, uh, where did the Chinese workers come from? What kind of food did they eat? Uh, why do we not know their names? Uh, when, did, when did they participate? How many Chinese worked on the Transcontinental Railroad? These are all questions that there have been been answered to, to a certain extent, but really they're open questions that this research project has tried to answer. So let's see what, some more answers here. Comparison with American workers mix, missing. Okay. Yeah. Um, looking at what, what American workers, yeah, there's one question there. What were the Chinese workers paid in comparison to workers of European descent? Yeah. Um, Thomas says, thinking about logistical aspects such as food or remittance, I think this project focuses on humanizing their experiences. Absolutely. That is glossed over. The question about, uh, let's see, Ingrid says, the question about where did the Chinese come from? Many texts don't talk about the differences in Chinese people, uh, demographics and ethnic difference. That's right. It's uh, a lot of times the ideas of this sort of monolithic and uh, uh, group where everyone, everyone is is the same. That's right. Um, Bessie says attempts to put a human face, uh, stimulates curiosity. And then uh, Tan says, what kinds of skills the Chinese brought to the project? How did they contribute to the success of the project? Yeah, there's lots, lots of questions here. Where American labor unions, uh, were there American labor unions against those Chinese building the railroad? 
So lots of questions. Um, let me, so let me share a little bit. I'll stop sharing here and then I'll share, uh, go to the actual website so you can take a look at that and see what that looks like. Um, let me share screen. And let's enter a full screen. So here is a, here's a page for Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project. And you'll find background information about the project um, and uh, what, who's, who's been collaborating on it. Uh, and there's also lots of books and papers that have come out um, from the project, which you'll have links to here. Uh, Key questions, the ones I mentioned, if you click key questions, you'll get the answers here. And it, they're not answering all these questions. They're, it, this is what have, they figured, what have they been able to find out? Many of these questions are still remain unanswered. Um, and so you, you can see here what historians, what this project has been able to answer and what they have not been able to answer. Um, and it's a really, it's a great overview of these very basic questions that you think everyone should really know. Um, so you can scroll through there. Another uh, really good resource on this page is the timeline, which you see there's a, there's a link here. Um, can, can, can everyone see my mouse when I move it around? Okay. I have a tendency to just kind of move the mouse around constantly. So I'm going to try to be, uh, I'm going to try to be good about that and uh, not do that. But so let's click through the timeline here. Here. So this is a really, what I really like about this timeline is that you see it starts in 1858 and it scrolls through. There's so many different events and different points that it includes, um, you know, including riot, you know, riots um, and, and, uh, uh, you know, when, when certain things were finished, uh, tunnels, uh, but a lot, really what this is, is it outlines where the information comes from as well. Like, how do we know, what, what, what is the evidence for this? Why, why is this the timeline that we have? Um, this timeline can be filled in with more information at some point, but this timeline exists because historians have done their job and researched and found primary source materials. So for example, here it says the daily, and I'll just highlight this. The Daily Alta California reports that approximately 8,000 of the 50,000 Chinese in California are currently employed on the Pacific Railroad. And then it has, uh, has a link there. Um, so you really go through, you see the timeline and you see how you can use this to see how historians have sort of pieced together the information that they have and what resources they have used. Um, I think it's a great way to um, to give students insight into how um, into how the uh, how historians do their job and how we know things how we know things about the past and what gaps exist. Um, so this timeline can can be updated constantly as new information uh, comes in. So that's the key questions. Um, you can, I'm not going to go through everything here, but there's publications, um, which shows you all the books, all the, all the papers. Many of them are available online and uh, the other materials, uh, resources that, or materials that have been written as an outcome of this project. Um, finally, I want to show you the resources. So if we go in there, um, you have uh, bibliography, oral history interviews, which uh, are, can be used in many different ways, of course, with, uh, in the classroom. And then if you go down and you click for teachers, what you get here is uh, lesson plans that SPICE has produced. So I, let's just click in there. And if we go down, here are some lesson plans that SPICE has produced um, for uh, for this project, uh, because really you can you don't just want to send a student to the key questions for them to read about that. You want them to explore themselves, uh, to be historians themselves, and this uh, our lesson plans hopefully will offer that opportunity. Um, 
The first one is on just an introduction to Chinese railroad workers in North America project. It includes information on and activities on working with primary sources uh, and uh, differentiating between primary and secondary sources. And it looks at uh, some of the uh, oral, some of the interviews that have been done and the different types of uh, uh, ways in which historians have, have been able to find the information they've been able to find. Um, the second lesson, it looks at challenges to Chinese immigration and assimilation. Um, the third one, as you see, is human environment interaction. And then uh, the final one, it looks at San Francisco's Chinatown, um, which is one of the activities that I really like there is there's a map of Chinatown that's for people in Chinatown, like a local map. And then there's the tourist map. And you can kind of compare, you know, what is, what is a map for people that live in China look like, uh, you know, for the locals, what, what's important for them? And then what is important for the tourists that come in? And it talks about how, how Chinatown was built up um, as part of uh, the building of the railroad and the importance of not just San Francisco Chinatown, but, but other ethnic enclaves um, around the United States uh, uh, for, in general, for immigrant communities. Okay, let's see. And we go like that. Okay, screen sharing was stopped, so I will go back to my uh, go back to my presentation. Um, let's see, share and swap displays. Okay, so hopefully, okay, that looks good. Thanks, you, Rexil. Rexil is giving me the the thumbs up there. Um, Okay, so that's the Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project. And I think there's, there's lots to explore, so I really encourage you to look at it. And it's, it's still being updated, and they, they hold events um, that you can participate in, uh, online events, obviously, through Zoom now. Um, so I really encourage you to take a look at that. Okay. And then this, these were the lesson plans, again, that were included there. Okay, uh, what I want to share with you next is a graphic novel that was produced, that we produce at SPICE. And it's a graphic novel that follows the life or that shows the experiences of um, Chinese immigrants coming to the United States through Angel Island. Uh, and it really identifies how Chinese immigrants challenged and uh, attempted to circumvent uh, racist immigration laws. Because as we know, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, other, other times their immigrants had been excluded, but this was the first time that a specific group uh, was excluded through a law, uh, in this case, the Chinese. So it, uh, the, what the graphic novel looks at is uh, ways in which Chinese immigrants tried to circumvent this, this law. And it was really done in different ways, but the way that the, the graphic novel looks at, one of the ways is through what was called Paper Sons. Um, and in 1906, from after the Great San Francisco Earthquake, uh, all the records were, records were burnt down uh, of who was a U.S. citizen and who wasn't. Uh, and so uh, you, it was an opportunity for people to claim that they were U.S. citizens, uh, even if maybe they weren't, that they were born here. And so what happened was, and this is a very <laughs> abbreviated version, uh, it, it, you know, an, an uncomplicated version that I'm telling here, is that you had uh, Chinese in America who, after 1906, uh, claim citizenships or or were citizens in fact and then were bringing over family members from china but of course a lot of times they weren't these weren't family members these were were uh chinese chinese immigrants who wanted to come to the united states but they came as paper sons meaning they were they were the sons of uh, uh chinese americans but 
in paper only. So they were, they were known as paper sons and they had to navigate the system in the United States immigration system uh, when they came here to the US. Um, okay, let's see. So the graphic novel includes, it's based on primary sources or it's based on, on photographs, it's based on interviews, um, it's based on records. So it's, it's quite true to history. And if you look at the graphic novel, you can see the, the photographs. Some of these images here are incorporated into the actual graphic novel. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm, I'll sh I want to share with you a little bit of the actual graphic novel. Um, so let me do that. Okay. And sorry, one second. Okay. Well, let me just try to share this desktop right here. Um, uh, oh. Full screen mode. Uh, okay, good. Thank you, Rex. So getting the thumbs up again. So, um, so I'll go back to the beginning. Um, and this is, you'll get a sense for the kind of materials and what a, a SPICE curriculum looks like. Each SPICE curriculum unit or lesson plan has uh, connections to national standards, uh, suggested resources, essential questions. So in this case, how do the experiences of Chinese immigrants to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century differ from that of other immigrants um, and so on. And uh, there, and then there is objectives, materials, and procedures. So uh, in this case, you can see at the bottom here, we've started with students reading uh, from The New Colossus uh, by Emma Lazarus. And this idea of what the immigrant experience is like, or the idea of what, how America treats immigrants, which is a, sort of the prevailing notion, I think, um, or has been at least, um, and, and looking at Ellis Island and how that sort of symbolizes for many people the, the immigration experience to the United States. And offering this as a different understanding of that and looking at how, how people who didn't come through uh, Ellis Island and who weren't European, what their experience was like. Okay, so you know, there's a, you, you can follow, you can, you can follow these procedures or you can come up with your own, uh, your own procedures and use this, use this book uh, the way you want to. Um, quickly, just some examples here. Um, and we start with uh, uh, image of the crossing, what it was like to cross from, uh, from China to the United States. And I say that it was illustrated, the graphic novel was illustrated by a, a great artist named Rich Lee, who, um, who just did an amazing job. Um, and the, the graphic novel follows different people, it follows uh, um, a mother and her son who are coming over. It follows uh, a American citizen, a US citizen and his experiences. And then it primarily follows the 17 year old uh, boy. Um, which is sort of typical of the type of immigrants that came over. Um, here's some more on the boat and the conditions, the different experiences. And here you see European passengers and those in the first and second class were usually allowed to disembark immediately. Other passengers were transferred to a smaller ship and ferried to, to the immigration station on Angel Island. Here you see uh, San Francisco and Angel Island. If you live in the Bay Area, you can visit, which is just a fantastic, uh, it's, it's great to visit Angel Island. Um, it's a really good experience. 
Um, you obviously can't, the immigration station isn't open right now, but um, uh, hopefully, hopefully soon it will open up again. Um, uh, and if you can, I highly encourage you to visit because it's, it's a really great experience. But it was hidden, the immigration station was, it wasn't just on the island, it was hidden on the back of the island compared to San Francisco. You know, so people could not see uh, that there was an immigration station there. And you contrast that to, um, you know, the Statue of Liberty in the United States, or sorry, in New York, which is, you know, the symbol of immigration that's there for everyone to see. So this is sort of the other side, the, the, the other side of the immigration story. Um, we continue on uh, when they arrive, um, their expectations and how the reality is different from what they were hoping, um, how they were segregated and the, how different immigrants were tre treated differently, um, the health checks uh, the, that were happening there often very humiliating um, and uh, what life on the immigration station was like. And then it looks at these poems. This is an actual poem that was discovered there. The immigration station was set to be torn down in the 1970s, but luckily before that happened, uh, these, these poems were discovered that had been etched into the walls of, uh, uh, of the immigration station by Chinese immigrants, which uh, are just, incredible insight into the experiences of, uh, of Chinese immigrants at the time. Um, looks at food and the canteen, and this is here, they're showing how the, uh, the paper sons who were there had information smuggled to them about, you know, who, uh, what they should say when they were interviewed about their past. Um, and if they got caught, uh, oftentimes, the you know, to protect them, they would eat the, you can see there's a photo there of the, of the boy in his cap. He's eating the notes that he got um, uh, from the family that had been interviewed on the mainland. So, because um, their stories had to be, the stories had to align. If, uh, if the immigration services interviewed the, his supposed parents in San Francisco and they said one thing and he said another thing, then it wouldn't work out. Um, so here's this, here's, uh, here's images of the interviews. And if, if you remember this image in the middle here is based on an actual photo image that you could see. Okay, I'm not gonna go through everything. Um, it also shows the role of women on the island and, uh, and how they worked uh, and how they, their, their experiences. Okay, um, so let's go back to, let's go back to, uh, okay, here, um, stop share, and let me go back to my, There, PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Oh, yep. Okay. Thank you, Rexo. So you see some of these primary sources, again, that the graphic novel is based on. Um, there's that image uh, that you saw was copied in the book. And it, it's in the graphic novel. It's, I think it's a really good way for students um, to get introduced to Angel Island um, in, a, in a unique kind of way. Um, here are some activities, and, and maybe you can come up, think of some different activities as well. But um, after, after reading the graphic novel, you can have students uh, design, uh, you know, a brochure to try to tempt Chinese citizens uh, to immigrate to the United States, uh, or create a role play, uh, develop an extra scene for the graphic novel. Um, there's some political cartoons um, that are looked at as well, and I think there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that can be done um, based on the graphic novel. Okay, we don't have, I don't have that much time left. So um, I am gonna go straight to, 
Uh, our next resource, so um, we've looked at the, uh, the railroad project at Stanford, we've looked at the graphic novel, and then this is the third uh, resource that I wanna share with you today. And it's uh, a teacher's guide that we created at Spice that is based on uh, this book right here, Chinese, uh, Chinese American Voices. Uh, so this is a collection of primary sources left by Chinese Americans themselves. Uh, it represents, again, it's a diverse, uh, a, the diversity of Chinese American experiences uh, in, in the United States. Um, because a lot of times people think when they think of Chinese immigrants, they think of the railroad, or maybe they think of Angel Island, but that's sort of where it ends, or maybe that's, that's all they get from the textbook. And they might think of, um, you know, again, this idea of a monolithic group that comes to the United States. And the reality is that Chinese American experiences every, are as diverse as the experiences of any other immigrant group. And that was one of the goals with this book right here. Um, it challenges uh, this, this idea that uh, Chinese Americans were uh, monolithic, that they were passive, um, and uh, it really offers uh, insight into how, how diverse the group Chinese, American, Chinese Americans were and are today. So I thought I'd just, um, I'll read just the first paragraph from this book, because um, I think it really sets up um, the story well. So the story of the Chinese and American has been, to has been curiously told. In most accounts, they have been mute. So they haven't had a voice themselves. Although they have been integral to this country's history, their voices have rarely been included by either their historical contem contemporaries or subsequent writers. Although one historian of their experience even described them as silent sojourners, in fact, they were ignored. They were laborers who helped build much of the American West in the 19th century, but they were not asked what they felt about their toil. They were victims of murderous violence, social ostracism, and discriminatory legislation, but they were not asked for their reaction. Their lives were described variously as quaint and exotic, as depraved and threatening, and more recently, as successful and exemplary, but they were not asked to describe their own lives in their own terms. Missionaries, journalists, and historians may have written about what the Chinese in America did or what was done to them, but they often neglected to consult the Chinese themselves. So this is, it offers the Chinese themselves talking about their experiences. And one of, the, one of the biggest challenges of putting this book together was that a lot of primary sources exist out there, but many of them are in Chinese. So this required, it required historians who are knowledgeable, who speak Chinese to go out and gather these, these sources and to translate them. And I find that really, really powerful. When you think about students who come from different backgrounds, if you have students in your class of different backgrounds, just what they can offer, what new perspectives they can offer. Because these, often in history for too long, uh, if something it doesn't exist in English, it has been ignored. Uh, and this really puts together, um, gives, a, gives a whole new uh, view and understanding of uh, the Chinese American experience. So quickly, um, it covers three different periods uh, in uh, Chinese American history, early Chinese immigrants, 1852 to 1904. Um, so it covers the time of the anti-Chinese movement and from the railroad, railroad worker, uh, railroad building uh, to uh, 1904, then life under exclusion. Um, and how Chinese Americans modernized uh, the impact of the Sino-Japanese War uh, and World War II on the Chinese community. And then the third part is 1943 to the present, or in this case, 2003, uh, becoming an integral part of uh, America. So uh, the types of sources that are looked at here are immigration case files, uh, legal documents, uh, manuscripts, speeches, testimonies, letters and correspondence, oral history interviews, 
uh, magazine articles, poems, folk songs. There's, there's really a, a diverse group of, or uh, different types of, uh, of sources that are included. And uh, I wanted to share one of the, uh, one of the sources that's included since we've talked about immigration and uh, uh, the uh, Angel Island and the Statue of Liberty and uh, what that stands for. And this one is called A Chinese View of the Statue of Liberty. And uh, you can read along as, as I read it. Sir, a paper was presented to me yesterday for inspection, and I found it to be specially drawn up for subscription among my countrymen toward the pedestal fund of the Bartholdi Statue of Liberty. So the Statue of Liberty was desi designed by uh, Bartholdi and given to the United States by the French. Um, and they were raising money in this case uh, for a pedestal. Seeing that the heading is an appeal to American citizens, to their love of country and liberty, I feel that my countrymen and myself are honored in being thus appealed to as citizens in the cause of liberty. But the word liberty makes me think of the fact that this country is the land of liberty for men of all nations except the Chinese. I considered it as an insult to us Chinese to call us to contribute toward building in this land a pedestal for a statue of liberty. That statue represents liberty holding a torch which lights the passage of those of all nations who come to this country. But are the Chinese allowed to come? As for the Chinese who are here, are they allowed to enjoy liberty as men of all other national that all uh, as men of all other nationalities enjoy it? Are they allowed to go about everywhere for, free from the insults, abuse, assaults, wrongs, and injuries from which men of other nationalities are free? Liberty, we Chinese do love and adore thee, but let not those who deny thee to us make of thee a graven image and invite us to bow down to it. So I just, this is one of the pieces that I found really powerful and there's lots more uh, in Chinese American voices. And what I find, you know, it, what I find especially powerful is that so, so many of these sources point out how, how vibrant uh, the Chinese American community is and how they were not silent, how they fought injustice, how they worked uh, to claim their rights and how they organized. Uh, and that, you know, that's not included in, uh, uh, in, in many of the histories. Uh, it works, it really, shows uh, what a sort of narrow stereotype many people have of uh, Chinese immigrants and Asian immigrants in general. Um, and the, the sources, they don't just look at the past, they look at the present too, of the, you know, this idea of a model minority. Uh, and it really, gives a diverse, gives students a diverse understanding and readers in general, a diverse understanding of, um, of Chinese, Chinese uh, American experiences. And it looks at Chinese Americans who live in all different states. It looks at, it has examples from Chinese Americans of different ages, um, LGBTQ Chinese Americans, uh, it, Chinese Americans who are of different different socioeconomic backgrounds, so it gives a much fuller picture um, of of the experiences. Okay, let's see. Uh, all right, so I sh I should uh, I, I will stop sharing because I do want to give some time for questions. Um, I do want to mention that uh, we the teacher's guide that um, the book and teacher's guide. Uh, we're not, uh, they're, they're available through the SPICE website, but the great thing is that many of these resources are now available online too. So if you search for uh, a Chinese view of Statue of Liberty, you can find it online. Um, and you can find, uh, you can find uh, the table of contents and look at all the different primary sources uh, online very easily as well. Uh, having said that, I encourage you to buy the book because uh, it really, it really is a good resource. Um, and if you buy it through the SPICE website, uh, you get the, uh, the teacher's guide, which, which could be helpful too. Um, the graphic novel is available 
on the SPICE website um, for another week. If you go and download it, it's free. So we made it free for the for participants, specifically for participants uh, or with the idea that participants in this workshop could download it. So you go there and then um, it says it's $10, but if you add it to your, uh, um, if you add it to your cart, you'll see that the price is zero and that'll be a digital version. Um, so I think I'll, um, I'll open things up to questions at this point. Jonas, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for taking us on uh, essentially a bullet train ride through some of the resources that SPICE has developed. And you've also had product endorsements in the Q&A section. Several people have endorsed the professional development programs and others have endorsed the content that you folks uh, do such a wonderful job. You're really path breaking in terms of the materials that you uh, create. And so thank you for that. We only have about 10 minutes. Um, and I apologize, but I wanted to take one moment to list a number of other sources, okay? And again, I apologize for that. I love the, the example you gave from the Statue of Liberty, uh, the response. And unfortunately, that wasn't the last time that Chinese Americans were insulted. or participation or any number of other things. Uh, an early book that did some of what you folks have done is uh, by uh, uh, Leo Li and David Arkush, Land Without Ghosts. And that's old, that's 30 years old, 31 years old. And it may not be as user friendly. It doesn't have a teacher's guide, but it's a very good reference. You mentioned Gordon Chang, the uh, historian at Stanford who you know, shepherded the railroad project. He's also the author of a wonderful book, Friends and Enemies, about the US-China relationship. And two last pitches uh, for that early history. Uh, Voices from the South China Sea. Uh, it's a book written by a U.S. naval captain about these four giant steam paddle wheel boats that were to bring immigrants, actually they weren't intended to be immigrants, but labor from China to the United States and to take them back. And tragically, one of these boats caught on fire and sank in the South China Sea. And it's a story of the dreams, the hopes of these people. They were going back, many of them perished uh, with pockets full of gold that they had earned working in the United States. Wonderful resources and uh, a very good fit with what Helen talked about yesterday. One last point that uh, Jonas, you've made, is that there was pushback. People didn't accept exclusion. People found ways to work around it. And there's a great book on this subject by a USC colleague of mine, Lon Kurashige, called Two Faces of Exclusion. Two Faces of Exclusion. Wonderful resources. And we have in the Q&A section an invitation from 1990 stalwart uh, Bill Kwong to uh, take people to Angel Island if at some point a tour might be arranged, right? So a lot of great ideas. Jonas, I want to take you back to one of the first things you talked about, but didn't go into detail on, that divided memories unit and uh, about the different ways of representing history. And that's one of the great strengths of all of these SPICE products is bringing in multiple perspectives. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so the Divided Memories was created. It was, it was a project um, at Stanford, and I think uh, not just at Stanford, but that's where they had, uh, uh, that's where they had uh, the workshop or the conference uh, to get together the research on different textbooks. Um, and how different textbooks write about history. Um, and so uh, what SPICE did was put together, and it was uh, really our 
curriculum writers, Rylan Sakiguchi, who put it together, um, was take excerpts from uh, different, uh, different textbooks and offer a comparison to look at how, does, um, how do different textbooks look at the same event in history. Uh, and it provides a framework to analyze the different textbooks. So it's not just what they write. You look at, you look at the numbers that they include. Um, you know, do they include, uh, do they include the numbers of deaths or do they, and, and, and whose deaths do they include? What numbers and, and how do they talk about them? Do they say, do they, uh, do they call things atrocities? You know, what vocabulary is used? And it also looks at what information is not used, what is omitted, uh, which is almost just as interesting, uh, what's omitted from different history textbooks. Uh, and so you get a, you get a comparison um, of different approaches. Uh, and what one really interesting, uh, one, you also look at images from the different textbooks. And one activity there is an image that it looks like Pearl Harbor, but it's actually from Darwin in, uh, in Australia um, and uh, the bombing of Darwin. And of course, to US, US readers, as soon as you see the image, they, they, you know, they're like, oh, that's Pearl Harbor uh, because they, uh, you know, they come with their own, their own uh, uh, preconceived understanding or notions and they apply those. So it's also looking at like, it's also looking at what do we bring? What do students bring to their understanding of history and how, um, how can we make students aware of that? Uh, now that's outstanding. And uh, you know, all of these SPICE products, as you highlighted in your presentation, uh, they draw on research and they involve looking deeply into these things and then careful consideration of, okay, how do we share this with students? And maybe you could say a little bit about the process in which you develop these curriculum materials, how you interact with teachers to get their, their feedback on this. All of you working on this field are veteran teachers, so you have your own experiences, but maybe say something about how you bring these into creation. Um, how we bring the curriculum units into creation? That's right. I, take us behind the scenes of making the best curriculum units out there. Oh, geez. Uh, well, I mean, we're lucky because we because we work at Stanford. We we work with uh, we work with experts in the field, um, and so it usually starts with us going to um, uh, you know what going to Gordon Chang, for example, and saying, okay, we'd like to create a curriculum unit or we'll, we're going to create a lesson plan or a teacher's guide um, and finding out what, what perhaps they think is you know, the most important, what, what are the most important things to include? Uh, and what is it, what are the, what are the outcomes we want from students? Uh, so we get to work with uh, um, just, you know, up to date, up-to-date information and uh, and research and the latest uh, uh, the latest thoughts and ideas on on uh, on different topics, and then you and then get, you get great information to start with, but yeah. how do you make it accessible? Uh, well, dare I say, trial and error. Uh, we we have uh, you know we have different. Um, we each each curriculum unit is different, um, and I think what because we offer workshops and professional development, and we've been doing that for um, for a really long time. It gives us an opportunity to find out what works for teachers and what they find most useful. Um, because usually, when we present curriculum, um, we also ask for feedback or uh, for what how they how these teachers would use the information and how they would how they would be able to use it in their classroom and so it's a constant process of uh, adjusting and uh, um, updating and uh, getting feedback from teachers and trying to figure out what works best no that's that's outstanding uh, a couple of people in the q and a you know they're they're asking okay are some of these materials available in Chinese. We have a lot of Chinese language teachers in the group today, and some of them are curious about 
uh, you know, are the graphic novels, are there Chinese versions of these, that sort of thing? You know, I, it would be great to have a Chinese version of the graphic novel. Uh, we don't have that, but that is an excellent idea. Um, uh, per, that's something we could think about. Uh, I am, I know that on, um, uh, on the Chinese American or, or Chinese railroad workers website that, you know, they have links to resources and materials that they've used. Uh, and on there you can find, uh, uh, you can find primary sources in Chinese. Um, so that's, that's a, that's a really good place to look for that. Um, I do just, just quickly, cause I see that people, I just been notified that people are going in to, uh, download the graphic novel, which is great. Um, you do, I just found out that you do have to enter a, um, you do have to enter, I think you have to enter a, a discount code, which is ASNC 2020. Um, so make sure to do that. Um, uh, if, if, if you're not able to download it for free. Now, thank you for that. I think a lot of people are going to want to do that. We're going to have to transition to our next, uh, our next uh, uh, session. But Jonas, I wanted to thank you for this. And to highlight, there are so many treasures at the SPICE website. Uh, not everybody knows, but uh, long before I got involved at the university level, I taught at the secondary level. And one of the most helpful units that I bought with my uh, limited funds was a unit from Spice of the Japanese, the Japanese and American collision in the mid 19th century. Uh, the, you know, the uh, Commodore Perry mission and things like that. Spice has been helping teachers for a very long time. Friends, make sure you go to that site and take advantage of it. And those of you uh, who are within, within uh, uh, driving distance and now they're offering online programs as well, take advantage of SPICE's professional development opportunities. Uh, they really are wonderful. And also one last comment, your students can study with SPICE as well. SPICE has a couple of programs for high school students uh, focusing on Japan, China, this sort of thing. So take advantage of it. Uh, Jonas, any last words? No, thank you so much, Clay. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Margaret, and thank you, Rexel, for uh, for inviting me to this. Um, feel free to, uh, I guess, I'll give you my email, J C E D M A N. Um, and feel free to email me or contact anyone at Spice if you have questions. Uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll hang out for about 10 minutes to answer some questions, to answer the questions that are in the Q&A here in written form. Um, but thank you so much.